Okay, good morning, everyone. Nice to see uh, some people arriving uh, at the stream this morning. Um, just a reminder, uh, we are working our way through our section on uh, open problems, uh, open, open problems and challenges in the field uh, of evolutionary robotics. In the last few weeks, we've looked at uh, trying to create more modular solutions, dealing with the competing conventions problem. Then we spent several lectures looking at the problem of crossing uh, the reality gap. And we started last time by looking at the issue of scalability. So rather than just one or a few researchers trying to create fitness functions and evolve robots against them, can we gradually invite increasing numbers of non-experts into the enterprise of evolving uh, robots? And um, we're looking at one approach to this, uh, which is approach approach from my own group, Twitch Plays Robotics, which is a little bit meta since we're teaching on uh, Twitch this morning, but uh, we'll talk about Twitch Plays Robotics. And just as a reminder, um, we are using Twitch Plays Robotics to, do, to um, invite non-experts in to tackle a particular aspect of robotics, which is trying to teach uh, robots language. Uh, a couple housekeeping notes before we get started. For the University of Vermont students, remember that there is an attendance sheet uh, linked in the schedule today, so go and uh, just add yourself to today's uh, attendance before we get into it. Uh, hopefully all of you uh, by last night, uh, all the undergraduates submitted uh, their ideas for the final project. Um, the TA and I will try and go through that as soon as we can to give you an idea about whether your project is overly or underly uh, ambitious and, and give you some suggestions um, there. I will also spend the first uh, few minutes at the beginning of each lecture um, sort of showing you a few of the less obvious tips and tricks in PyroSim that might help some of you for different aspects of your uh, final project. So I'm going to talk about wheels for a moment. And as I do, um, if anyone has any other questions about things they need to add to their final project that aren't immediately obvious to, about how to add them in PyroSim, uh, please just type your question into chat and I will tackle them if we have time. So we're going to talk about wheels first, um, but before we do, I just want to point you to uh, some more documentation for PyroSim. So if you, uh, and I'll add this, you'll be able to follow along with this on the video afterwards. If you go to our GitHub repository, uh, this is the repository for my lab, the MEC lab. If you go to github.com uh, slash MEC dash LAB, that'll take you to the MEC lab um, set of code repositories. In there, you'll see our most recent version of PyroSim. Not all of you are using this particular version of PyroSim, but for most things, it's close enough. If you click on uh, the code repo for PyroSim, uh, the code repo for PyroSim and scroll down to the README, you'll see that there's a link to the documentation. If you click on documentation, uh, there's stuff here on installation and getting started. Most of this is stuff that you've already seen in the uh, 10 assignments. If you click on uh, code documentation to the left, uh, you will see documentation for every function that's available to you in PyroSim. The one at the top is to actually create a simulator and a description of all the command line, uh, all of the arguments that you can pass in to uh, those functions. So as I mentioned, you can scroll th through here and get a, a feel for some of the other uh, features that PyroSim offers that we haven't talked about. For example, the ball and socket joint. So as the name implies, this is based on the way your shoulder is put together that allows more kinds of rotations than a simple uh, hinge joint does. Uh, I promise to talk about wheels. So let me scroll down to, uh, let me scroll down to, The, what in this version is called the rotary actuator, but in, in your case, this is the, um, uh, the motor associated with a hinge joint. You'll notice um, that there is an additional parameter here called, uh, sorry. 
There's an additional uh, parameter here called control, and this control is basically a switch. You can set it to either positional or velocity. So what does that mean? Well, when you're uh, creating, when you're controlling a robot, you can control it in one of two ways. You can use position control or velocity control. What you've been doing in the 10 uh, assignments is using position control, which means that the output from your uh, output from a motor neuron, that value is treated as a desired angle or a desired position that the motor then tries to uh, achieve. So you can think of the number that's arriving at a motor neuron as a number described in radians, right, an, a, 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 an angle. You can also control a robot using velocity control, where the value, if you set, uh, if you set control equal to velocity for an actuator, when that actuator receives a number from a motor neuron, it interprets that number not as a desired angle, but as a desired angular velocity, which is a unit, a number that's described as radians per second. So if we have, uh, if we have an axle, which you create, if you create a, uh, an axle for a wheeled uh, robot, for example, which is a cylinder, and then you attach to that cylinder uh, a sphere, which is going to be your wheel, and you attach the wheel to the cylinder with a rotational joint with the joint normal uh, lying parallel to the axle, that means that this object will rotate relative to this object like this. If you then send, uh, if the motor neuron sends a positive value and this uh, joint is controlled by velocity control, the, if it's a positive value, it will start rotating forward. If it's a big positive number, it will rotate forward quickly. If it's a small positive number, it will rotate forward slowly. If the value is zero, it won't rotate. If the motor neuron outputs a small negative number, it'll roll backwards slowly. If the motor neuron outputs a large negative number, it will uh, rotate counterclockwise or backwards quickly. So depending on what you're doing, you can combine different motors that are controlled by position control or velocity control. Okay, uh, I hope that helps those of you that are working on uh, uh, adding wheels to your uh, robot. Okay, I don't see any other questions in chat about uh, tips and tricks for PyroSim, so we'll jump back to a lecture. And just as a reminder, we're looking at the Twitch Plays Robotics project, which we started uh, last time. Uh, and we had some lead up to this. We looked at the symbol grounding problem, which is this problem in which the robot can't understand it's hard to teach robots or computers language because any one symbol is just uh, defined as a combination of other symbols. So what we started to look at last time was a way to get is a, a way to invite the crowd. Remember, this is a crowdsourcing project in to help ground, help robots ground language in sensor motor experience. A robot who always re who recognizes that whenever the pressure on the soles of its feet drops to zero, it always hears JUMP, will start to understand or ground the symbol JUMP in its touch sensor information. And what jump will mean to the robot, the robot will understand JUMP to mean is sudden drop in pressure on all of its touch sensors. That's what JUMP uh, means. Okay, so uh, we ended last. I, we ended last time by uh, introducing Twitch Plays Robotics. It's an experiment that has four parts to it. In part one, we are going to uh, stream a whole bunch of robots acting randomly to a Twitch stream. So these are robots that are not evolving yet. We are simply generating large numbers of random controllers, downloading them onto simulated robots one after the other, sending the, stream, uh, sending the stream to Twitch, and then capturing back from Twitch the crowd's response to those robots in the form of chat. So I showed you a video of Twitch Plays Robotics last time, and I thought, since we're actually on Twitch, why don't we play this game? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you one robot. That robot is controlled by one random controller. 
And I want you to decide whether this robot is obeying the following command, move forward. Okay, so it's a, a yes or no question. If you, uh, when I play this robot, if you feel that the robot actually is moving forward, type Y for yes into chat. And if the robot, if you think the robot is not moving forward, type uh, N or no into chat. Ready? Here we go. You can type in yes or no at any time. This uh, robot is going to last for about another 10 seconds. Okay, so I think it, it's unanimous. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 22 uh, no votes and zero yes votes. So this robot receives 22, uh, 22 N's and zero yeses. I want you to hold on to that information. Uh, 23 no's. We just had uh, one robot playing one random controller under one command, uh, walk forward, and it received 23 no votes and zero yes votes. Okay, imagine now, and the stream isn't running this morning so we can't watch it, but imagine if it was running that instead of just the 38 of us that are currently on the stream and the one robot and the one random controller, we had large numbers of robots each of these robots was running large numbers of random controllers, and each of these random controllers was being run on the robot under hundreds or possibly thousands of different uh, English language commands. Walk forward, walk backward, turn left, stay still, look at the camera, prove for Matt's last theorem. For each, for each robot, each random controller, uh, sorry, each, each robot, each command, and each random controller there's associated with it one number, which is, uh, or sorry, two numbers, the number of yeses and the number of noes. Okay. So that's the data set that we start to build up in uh, the Twitch Plays Robotics project. So uh, let's have a look now at this data set that's being generated. I'm going to introduce some notation here, and you'll notice that there is an increasing number of uh, subscripts under each one. We're going to look at, uh, in this experiment, just two different robots, robot zero and robot one. Robot zero is the simple three-segment worm robot, and R1 is this slightly more complicated quadrupedal robot. So R sub i, where i can be zero or one, indicates which of the two robots we're dealing with. We have a large number of uh, English commands. Uh, so these are strings. Each of these Cs are strings. And we're going to reference them by C sub IJ, uh, where CIJ represents the Jth command that's been issued to the Ith robot. We received a large number of commands, which we'll look at uh, in a moment. Um, and for each of those commands, uh, for uh, for some of the, sorry for some of those commands, there were a large number of controllers, neural network controllers, that uh, actuated the robot while the robot quote unquote heard that command. So we're going to introduce n sub ijk, which represents the kth controller evaluated under the jth command for the ith robot. And as we just saw in the little uh, game we just played, we had a single n, a single c, and a single r. And we collected uh, 23 uh, 23 no votes, so S, which is going to represent, uh, which is going to re represent reinforcement signals. So reinforcement is a word that we're going to borrow from psychology. Reinforcement is some signal that is sent back to the learner. It could be a robot, could be an animal, could be a, a human child, where negative reinforcement is usually some form of mild punishment, and positive reinforcement is some kind of mild uh, reward. 
So uh, S sub i, j, k, 0 is going to represent, that's going to be a single integer, which is the number of no votes. So in our example that we just saw, S sub i, j, k, 0 equals 23. And in the case of uh, the, uh, the example we just saw, S sub i, j, k, 1, the number of positive reinforcement signals we got is the number of yeses, which in this case was 0. Okay. Okay, so here's the actual data we obtained. We ran this experiment back in 2016, and we ran it for about a month's time. Um, during that time, we collect, uh, there were 424 uh, people who came to our Twitch stream and typed some at least one thing into chat. We had large numbers of observers, but only 424 subjects actually participated. Um, during that month's time, we ran over 57,000 controllers, uh, random controllers on the robots. Uh, in this table here, you can substitute evaluations for controllers. Many of those random controllers were run uh, on the stream at times in which there were zero, uh, uh, zero observers of the stream, so those were discarded. Um, but over 6,000 of those uh, uh, controllers were actually, um, were actually seen and something was typed into chat in response to those controllers. We got a total of over 16,000 pieces of chat from our 424 uh, participants. Okay, let's look at commands. So uh, the crowd typed in almost 9,000 pieces of English, different kinds of uh, commands that they wanted to send uh, to the robot. But among those 9,000, many were repeats, and it turns out there were only 266 uh, distinct commands. Uh, I think there's a question uh, in chat. Does the bot care at all about when the reinforcement uh, signal was given. If someone said yes because the robot was moving forward for a second, does it see that second or just the bot as a whole? That's a very good question. Um, and clearly that can be important. In the 30 second video that you watched, there were periods in which the robot was slightly in front of the red line, which you could argue was moving forward. Uh, and then it moved back again. So in this first experiment, we did not tag the reinforcement signal for when it was received. Part of the reason why is that's difficult to do in Twitch. Um, there's a several second lag between when we send something to the stream and when it's seen by an observer on Twitch, and that lag is different for different observers. So it's very difficult for us to know exactly what the subject was seeing when they typed something in. Um, in this example here, you were all just typing in yes or no. Um, on the actual stream, you would have typed in O N which corresponds to orange robot, no, it is not uh, obeying the command. So the robot you saw was orange. So we show different colored robots one after the other, and by asking the subject to not only type in positive or negative reinforcement, Y or N, we also ask them to tag that reinforcement signal with a color so we know which robot that reinforcement signal is associated with. But when during that robot's evaluation that signal was issued, we, uh, we don't know. But that would be a good thing to try uh, in later experiments. Thanks for your question. Okay, um, so 266 unique strings were typed in, and the most common one was jump. It was typed in 385 uh, times. Walk forward was typed in 58 times, and so on. As I mentioned at the end of last time, you'll notice that uh, people tended to type in very short motoric commands. They could have typed in something like, walk forward for two seconds, then turn around three times, and then walk back to the origin as quickly as you can. Um, but that was quite rare. So this was a good first, uh, this was a good first positive result. It suggested to us that people are instinctual teachers. And without being asked to do so, they will instinctually scaffold the learning of the robots. Remember that scaffolding is something that a teacher applies to a learner to try and make things easier on the learner and allow them to start to learn the basics of a given task and then improve on that task uh, as the scaffolding is gradually removed. So one of the assumptions in Twitch Plays Robotics, if we are going to invite large numbers of non-experts to teach robots language, 
is that we're hoping that people will instinctually be good teachers. And it turns out that it, um, usually they are. Um, if anyone has young kids, most of us didn't get a manual in how to raise children. We somehow instinctually have an idea about what to do some of the time. Turns out that seems to also be true for our uh, virtual robots on Twitch. Okay, uh, reinforcement. So among the 9,000, uh, among the 16,000 pieces of chat, there were 7,500 yeses and nos that were typed in. Um, and we're going to define this variable O, which is the proportion of positive reinforcement. So for any one controller, the value of O can range between zero and one. A value of uh, O equals zero means unanimous no votes, which would have been the case for our uh, example that we just ran. So if I were to compute O for that controller that we just ran on the orange robot, it would have got an O of zero. If you had all typed in 23 yeses, that controller would have obtained a, a, an O value of one. Half yeses and half noes would give you a value of 0.5 and so on. Note that this is a proportion, not a sum. So this doesn't tell us anything about the total number of yeses and noes, just the ratio between them. Okay, so that's the data. Let's move on to phase three now of the experiment, which is to see whether the robots can actually learn to ground uh, language in action. Remember that up until now we've just been dealing with random controllers. So how are we going to get these robots to ground language? Well we dipped into our, I apologize for the resolution here, uh, we dipped into our data set and as I mentioned jump was the most uh, common command. So we're going to try and see whether these robots can learn jump and forget about all the other commands for now. We are then going to uh, extract from the data set all of the ends, um, all of the ends that received at least one yes or at least one no vote. Again, this might be hard to read. This is S sub IJK zero plus uh, S IJK one. So we're going to sum the number of yeses and the number of noes. And as long as there is at least one reinforcement signal under jump, we're going to add that controller to our uh, data set. And it turns out there were uh, several hundred of those controllers, controllers that had been run on, in this case, the simple worm robot. Um, that, and uh, the result, we, we now have our symbol, and what, if, we're gonna, if the robot is going to ground that symbol in its sensor motor experience, we need its sensor motor experience. What is that experience? Well, in the simple three-segment worm, in the simple three-segment worm, uh, we re-ran that worm off the stream now. So none of the learning or evolution occurred on the stream. The stream was just to collect all of the chat, all of the reinforcement signals from the crowd. We re-ran this worm robot in simulation. We put a touch sensor in each of the three segments. And then we ran that uh, robot in the simulator for a thousand time steps, which gave us back a sensor matrix which th with three columns corresponding to the three touch sensors in the robot. And each row corresponds to one time step in the simulation with the top row corresponding to t equals zero and the bottom most row corresponding to t equals 999. So the uh, element ij in the matrix represents the value of the, the uh, jth touch sensor at the ith time step. And as you can see here, this is binary information. Either the touch sensor was not firing or it was. So now we have, uh, so now what, what do we have? We have a set of controllers. For each of those controllers, we have the reinforcement signals and we have this matrix. So we're going to then take each of those controllers, and we have this T matrix for each controller, the touch sensor information, and for each matrix we're going to compute O, which is this proportion of yeses uh, and no's. So we have a whole bunch of T matrices. I think we did have about a little over a thousand. So we have uh, 1,038 T matrices, and we have 1,038 O values. 
We then want to see for a given touch, for a given touch matrix, can we predict or can we teach a neural network to predict what the O value is for that touch matrix? So um, the question is, is there even such a relationship? You can imagine that for jump um, and the simple robot, there may be such a relationship. What might that relationship between T and O be? What would you be looking in, for example, if there actually is a high value of O, a value of O that's near one, what would you expect to see in the T matrix? Alternatively, if O is close to zero, what would you expect to see in the T, -T matrix? What might those relationships look like for the symbol JUMP? I'll give you a minute to, to think about it, and if you have an idea, just type it straight into chat. Uh, a high value of O, meaning lots of yeses and little to no noes, means a section uh, of zero values for all three sensors. That's right. So you would expect to see rows in the matrix and probably contiguous rows in the matrix in which they're all zero, meaning all three touch sensors are not firing, meaning the robot is off the ground. And you would expect if the crowd saw that, they gave back lots of, of yeses. Uh, exactly. So that's what we'd be looking for. Alternatively, a low value of O would mean that for each row in the matrix, there's probably at least one touch sensor that's firing. The robot was in contact with the ground for most of the time. So now whether that's true or not in the data, we don't know, but it suggests it may be the case. And again, because I'm uh, showing you this experiment, you can imagine that it probably was the case. So here's a visualization that represents uh, the relationship between T on the horizontal axis and O on the vertical axis. So let's start with the vertical axis. I've told you up till now that O uh, ranges between 0 and 1. I think I misspoke. I think O actually ranges between minus 1 and plus 1. Uh, yes, that's right. So an O of minus 1 means unanimous no votes. An O of 1 means unanimous yes votes, and an O of 0 means there's an equal number of yeses uh, and noes. The horizontal axis here, what we did was to uh, actually perform manually a computation on each T matrix, which was to compute the proportion of time that the robot is on the ground. So we visited each of the thousand rows, and we calculated the proportion of those rows in which there was at least one, uh, there was at least one one value, compared to other rows in which there were all three uh, zeros. Each point here, uh, there should be about a thousand points here. Um, you can't see them all because a lot of them are overlapping. Uh, each point here corresponds to one of these random controllers that was run on the worm robot under the command JUMP. We got each touch, uh, each T matrix computed the proportion of time on the ground and plotted it versus uh, the O value. And you'll notice that there is a bit of a relationship here. It's not perfect, but there definitely is a relationship. What we did was to perform linear regression, one of the simplest ways to detect whether there is a relationship between your x variable and your y variable, or your independent variable and your dependent variable. Those terms are more familiar to you. In linear regression, you take a straight line and you try and place that straight line in the 2D plane. So that straight line is as close to all of the observations or all the green dots here as possible. You'll notice that there is no good straight line that will be very close to all the points, but the closest line has a negative slope that you uh, see here. What does the negative slope tell you? What does it tell you about the relationship between T and O? Does it validate our hypothesis from the previous slide or invalidate it?
if you have a uh, if you have a depend uh, an independent variable on the horizontal axis and a dependent variable on the vertical axis and you fit a straight line to it using linear regression and you get a straight line with a negative slope, what does that tell you about the relationship between these two variables? So our hypothesis from the previous slide was that generally more time on the ground generally more time on the ground means a lower reinforcement signal so uh, let's see more time on the ground so a, a larger value of the independent variable means uh, a lower value of the uh, a lower value of the the reinforcement signal that's right exactly so there is a relationship there's a definite relationship it's inversely proportional Right? So there is an anti-correlation between the independent variable, which is the touch information, and the dependent variable, which is the normalized reinforcement signal, meaning more of X means less uh, of Y and vice versa, which makes sense. The more time that the robot spends on the ground, the more no votes you expect back from the crowd. Again, it's not a, a very good fit. You can see there's a lot of points here that are very far from the line. These were all the random controllers executed under JUMP on the simple worm robot. And on the next slide, on the next slide here, all of the random controllers that were run on the quadruped, also under JUMP, and you can see again when we linearly regress against this data, we again obtain a straight line with a negative slope, meaning that the more time this robot spends on the ground, and in this case its T matrix had four columns, one for each of the touch sensors, each of the, the four touch sensors and the four legs. Again, the more time this robot spent on the ground, the more time that the crowd gave back uh, a no vote. The less time that the robot spent on the ground, which is the left part of this plot, the more uh, yes votes we t the robot tended to uh, receive. So these two plots taken together tell us uh, a fair bit of information about the Twitch Plays Robotics uh, experiment. The first thing it tells us is that, generally speaking, the crowd is honest. When the robot actually is jumping, they say why. When the robot actually is not jumping, they say no. Um, the data is a little messy, and this might be because people are uh, not typing the right thing in. They're typing yes and no in at random, or they're, uh, or they're deliberately lying. They're typing in yes whenever they know the robot isn't jumping and vice versa, but it's a pretty good fit. So another thing you'll notice is that if I flip back and forth between these two uh, plots, you'll notice that the, uh, the slope and the y-intercept of these lines are slightly different. Now the width of the axes in the two plots are also different, which is, uh, I apologize for that, but uh, the, the y-intercept and the slope also are different. What that means is that for these two robots, jump means a slightly different thing. So we could argue that because we were able to fit this line pretty well to the data, both robots understand jump. Now, under, quote unquote, understand is a loaded term. But because we've grounded this word in the robot's own experience, we, this word is a little bit more objective here. So by understanding the word jump, what we mean is that the robot knows the more time it spends on the ground, it is likely to get more no's from the crowd. That is what jump means to the robot. What it means is a relationship not just between the symbol J-U-M-P and its own felt experience, the T matrix, it is actually a relationship between three things, the symbol or the language, its own felt experience and the social repercussions of its actions. So this robot is learning what jump means by knowing that when it hears jump and does this, the crowd is likely to respond in this way. That's what it means. 
We could imagine that we continue on with this experiment and now issue to the, the robot the command, don't jump. Presumably if we did that and got enough data, that robot would learn an opposite and it, uh, regression line, which would be a positive slope. The more time that it spends on the ground, the more yeses it's likely to receive in response to the command, don't jump. Right? So in that way, you could imagine this robot grounding an increasing uh, amount of language in its own experience by learning relationships between symbols, actions, and social repercussion. Okay. Let's go, uh, so let's move on now to um, the next step in this experiment. I showed you linear regression that shows that there is a relationship between um, T and O, but we as the investigators still needed to do some work. We needed to perform a computation on uh, the T matrix using our own assumption about what jump means, which is the proportion of time the robot is grounded. Let's, in this next part of the experiment, relax that assumption. We are just going to use the raw T matrix and try and learn a relationship between the raw T matrix itself and O. How are we going to do that? Well, remember that for the worm robot, we have 1,038 T matrices. We have 1,038 O values. We're going to create a neural network now. This network, uh, as you can see, has three input neurons and one output neuron. We're going to set the four weights, as you see here. Let me zoom in a little bit. We have uh, four weights. Three of them connect the three input neurons to the output neuron. And the fourth weight is a recurrent connection going from the output neuron back to the output neuron. Remember that when we see a recurrent connection, that's a hint to us that this neural network is capable of memory. We're going to start by setting these four weights to random values. We're then going to take one of the thousand T matrices, and we're going to take the top row from that matrix, which are three binary values, plug them into the input layer, take each of those values, multiply it by the weight, take the other input value, multiply it by its weight, the third input neuron, multiply it by its weight, sum those three values together, put the raw sum in here, and then apply an activation function to squash this value to a value between minus one and plus one. We are then going to take the second row from that first T matrix, plug it into the input layer, propagate the value down to the output layer. At the output neuron, we're going to combine the previous value of the output neuron, uh, multiply the previous value of the output neuron times W3, and add it to the raw incoming sum, and continue this process for the thousand rows that are in that first T matrix. So far, so good? Okay. We are then going to read out the value that arrives at the output neuron, and we are not using this neural network to control a robot. We are using this neural network to try and learn a relationship between T and O. In this cartoon example here, we have four random weights. We fed in the first T matrix one row at a time, and after we fed in all thousand rows, in this example, we're going to read this value out, and it happens to be 0.529. We're going to call this O prime IJK, and the prime here is a reminder that this is a prediction from the neural network. It's predicting that under jump, Whatever that T matrix is, this neural network is predicting this is the result from the crowd. This is the proportion of yeses to nos. In this cartoon example, it's 0.5, meaning there's about twice as it, this neural network is predicting that for this action, the crowd gave back twice as many yeses as nos. Remember that we know the actual value of O. In this case, it's minus 0.8. Uh, very close to minus one, meaning in reality, when the crowd saw the, the controller that produced this touch data on the worm robot, most of the crowd said no. So there's a big difference between 0.25 and minus 
0.8. So this neural network made a pretty bad prediction about the crowd's response to this robot behavior. Hold that thought for a moment. We've just pushed the first T matrix through this neural network. We're going to erase all of the values in the neurons, but leave the weights as they are. We're now going to take the second of our 1,038 T matrices, push it through this neural network again. It's going to make, after we push through the thousand rows of that second T matrix, we get back a second O prime value. We get a second prediction from the neural network. It's prediction about how the crowd responded to that second random controller run on the worm under the command JUMP. And we compute the difference between the prediction and the actual crowd response. And we do that now uh, for this neural network for all 1,038 neural networks, uh, all 1,038 T matrices. We sum up all the 1,038 differences between the prediction and the actual crowd response. And that value is going to serve as the fitness for this neural network. So uh, the difference, uh, we, we're going to assign the distance or the, diff the total difference between the predictions and the actual values. Imagine we now have, uh, maybe I'll just pause there for a moment. That's a lot of information. We've just described um, one random neural network and evaluated its ability to predict the crowd's response to the 1,038 uh, controllers we ran on the worm robot under jump. Any questions before I move on? No, okay. All right, so uh, we just did that with one random neural network. Um, we're going to try and evolve neural networks that minimize uh, their different, the difference between their predictions and uh, the actual crowd response. Uh, there is a question here. Does each T matrix represent a different controller? Yes. So uh, we have, let's just scroll back out for a moment. Remember that we have 1,038 controllers. N represents the number of controllers. We have 1,038 controllers that were run on the worm robot under the command JUMP. And uh, each of those 1,038 controllers received at least one yes or one no back from the crowd. There were actually probably many thousands of controllers that were run on the worm under JUMP, but a large number of those controllers were never seen by the crowd or the crowd never typed in a yes or no with those controllers. Okay, so it's a little confusing here because uh, we have two kinds of control, we have two neural networks here. We have the, the set of N's, neural network controllers, that animate the robot. And we've now introduced a second type of neural network, which is not controlling the robot. We're going to try and evolve these neural networks to produce accurate predictions. What are they trying to predict? They're trying to predict for a given uh, set of sensor data obtained from the worm, worm robot, this neural network is trying to predict how the crowd responded. So far, so good? Okay. Okay. So we just described this one uh, neural network here. Imagine that we have a population of neural networks, um, and each of them has a random set of four weights, and we're going to push each of those 1,038 T matrices through each neural network in the population one after the other, and we're going to assign a single number back to each neural network in the population, which is it, the accuracy of its predictions. And I, we're going to talk about distance because distance uh, is inversely proportional to accuracy. A neural network that gets a distance of zero, meaning every O prime, every one of its predictions is exactly equal to the actual crowd response, is a perfect neural network. It's a perfect predictor. A neural network that gets back a distance of a a very large distance means its predictions are very far 
from reality, very far from what the crowd actually did. So we're going to assign this distance value to each neural network in the population, and we're going to evolve these populations of neural networks to minimize distance. So we're going to delete neural networks in the population that have higher D and hold on to neural networks in the population that have lower D. And we're then going to make randomly modified copies of the neural networks or of their synapses. We're going to make randomly modified copies of those lower D neural networks to replace, to fill in the gaps in the population vacated by the higher D controllers that were just deleted and repeat this process. We're going to use a simple evolutionary algorithm to uh, search for a good set of four weights that will produce accurate predictions. So far so good? Okay. So we're now going to move on to, if there aren't any questions, we're going to move on to the very final stage of this experiment which is how well, how, well do, how, well are these, uh, how well are these controllers actually doing? We're going, to test, uh, we're going to test the best controllers in the population, and we're going to take the, test the best neural networks in the population, where neural networks in the population that got very low D, we're going to, we're going to, uh, when evolution finishes, we're going to expose them to new T matrices they've never seen before, and see how accurate their predictions are. You might remember when we talked about neural networks at the beginning of the course, um, where there is always the danger that a neural network will overfit the data, meaning that instead of learning the relationships in T that predict O, instead it will memorize all of the T matrices that it receives and output the right O value for it. So to make sure that the robot isn't simply memorizing, that it's actually learning the relationship between T and O, we're going to expose the trained neural networks to T matrices they've never seen before and see how well they do. We do the same thing with students. Uh, you may be tempted to memorize a final exam from previous years of a course, and the easiest way to tell whether a student has memorized or actually learned the course content is to not give final exams from past years, but to come up with new final exams, or in our robot's case, expose it to new T matrices. How do we do that? Well, I just explained that we have these 1,038 uh, controllers for the worm robot under jump. We did not actually train these neural networks on all 1,038. We randomly picked half of them and trained these networks on whatever that is, 500 or so. Uh, and then after evolution, we took the neural network that had the lowest D and exposed it to the other 500 uh, neural networks that had the other 500 ends that it had not seen before and the other 500 T matrices associated with them and see and saw how well the neural network did on that test data. And if it's D, if its distance was low, meaning its prediction accuracies were high on T matrices it's never seen before, that means that this neural network is not memorizing. It's actually discovered a relationship between T and O. So if you give it a new T, it'll give you back that it's never seen before. It'll still give you an accurate prediction. So far, so good? Okay. Okay, so let's see how well uh, this process did. Let's start with the simple worm robot. Again, this is we're looking at the simple robot just for jump. And it turns out um, that of the, uh, the good, the, the accurate neural networks that we evolved during training, when we expose them to, uh, when we expose them to T matrices they'd never seen before, they got an average distance or error, as it's mentioned here, is point. Four, two. Remember that the predictions of O prime can lie between minus one and plus one, and the actual value of O ranges between minus one and plus one. So the, the worst thing that a predictor could do would, would be to predict an O prime of one when the actual value of O is minus one, 
or predict an O prime of minus one when the actual value of O is one and the difference there would be two. That's the, that's the worst you can do. A, an error of zero is that O prime always equals O. You can, note, you can see with the green bar here, the green point here, that the neural network, the, the, the neural networks get an error of about 0.42. So not great, but not terrible. We can then ask the question, how good is those, are those predictions? Well, we created a control experiment, which is shown in red. I'm not going to talk about the blue one. And the red one here is called permuted control. What is permuted control? I'm going to go back for a moment. Remember that I told you is that we had for the worm robot, we had 1,038 T matrices. And for each one of those T matrices, we have a value of O, the actual crowd's response. We permuted this data set composed of 1,000 T's and 1,000 O's by taking each of the T's, picking two T's at random, taking their two O values, and flipping them. So we started to permute the O's, and we took O's and associated them with different T's, not the T that they were actually associated with. So we're permuting the O's, but leaving the thousand T's in place. So we have, we still have the same 1,038 O's, we've just shuffled them. We again tried to train neural networks to take as input T and predict the permuted O, and then look to see how well uh, those uh, how well the, those neural networks did on the permuted data, and as you would expect, they did much worse. They got significantly higher error, not by much, but the fact that the green point is lower than the red point tells us that there is a relationship between T and O, and these neural networks are starting to learn at least some of that relationship. If we permute O's and corrupt that relationship, we move O's and associate them with other T's, we break that relationship, and the neural networks cannot learn much. We did exactly the same experiment with the more complex quadrupedal robot, and again, we found that there was a relationship between T and O, and those neural networks actually could learn that relationship better compared to the permuted control. So what does that mean all taken together? Well, that means this is a positive result. It means, first of all, that if you expose robots to the crowd, um, they are a, the crowd can generate teachable commands, which in this case was JUMP. We don't know uh, how well the crowd did at grounding other commands like walk forward in the robot sensor motor experience, but at least for jump, the crowd was relatively accurate. And uh, by giving those robots touch sensors, at least for jump, we could then train a neural network to find a relationship between the robot's actions and how the crowd responded to those actions. So that gives us some confidence that we might start to be able to move up this ladder or enable robots to move up this ladder with the help of the crowd by teaching jump and then possibly doing the same thing with increasingly abstract uh, commands. Okay, so we got this far, we got to jump how far up towards uh, things like embodied metaphors which are quite abstract that we saw last time, who knows, it was a first step in that direction. Okay, there's some additional slides uh, in here but I think I'm going to uh, skip over those in the interest of time. Um, if you have any questions about the Twitch Plays Robotics project, please ask them now in chat. Otherwise, we will move on to Lecture 22, which was another crowdsourcing effort um, related to evolutionary robotics. Okay, so uh, we had success with this Twitch Plays Robotics project. So in my group, we, we conducted another crowdsourcing robotics project called the DotBot project. In Twitch Plays Robotics, it seems that people are instinctual teachers. They will instinctu instinctually issue short motoric commands to robots, and then they will provide honest reinforcement. Yes or no, the robot did or didn't jump. 
The question now is, uh, people are all, not just instinctual teachers, but they instinctually understand something. Uh, humans instinctually understand movement because we ourselves have to move ourselves from point A to point B. Can we uh, similarly rely on people's ability to understand movement to help us automatically design moving robots better? So in the Twitch Plays Robotics project, we're going to, we relied on the fact that people are instinctual teachers. In uh, the DotBot project, we're going to rely on the fact that people instinctually understand the relationship between physiology and movement. As just one example of that, uh, we saw last time uh, when we talked about legged locomotion, we know that people uh, instinctually understand that being symmetric helps with movement. If you're asymmetric, very difficult to, to move efficiently. So in the DotBot project, we're going to see if we can exploit that fact. How does this work? In the DotBot project, we're going to invite people to draw robots by connecting the dots. And I think before I describe this slide, I'll show you, uh, a, I'll show you a screen grab of the DotBot project working. We used to run this in the browser, but unfortunately with updates to, to some browsers and JavaScript and so on, it no longer runs. So let me show you how this used to work. Uh, we'd ask people to connect the dots, and by doing so, they're creating the body of a robot. Once they're finished and they click Go, that body gets created in a physics engine running directly in the browser. You'll notice here that we're showing in real time the fitness of this crowd-created robot, which is the distance of the robot from the red ball, which is the, the origin. So let me start that again. So the person creates the body of the robot when it gets instantiated in the physics engine. When it gets instantiated in the physics engine, the computer creates a controller for this robot. So this is kind of the inverse of what we've seen before. We've seen a lot of evolutionary robotics experiments in which, uh, uh, sorry, not an inverse. Um, this is what we've seen before in a lot of experiments, which is that humans create robot bodies and AI creates robot controllers. This is doing the same thing, but now doing it directly in uh, the browser. Uh, I'll just pause that explanation for a moment. There's a question about uh, going back to Twitch Plays Robotics. Um, in Twitch Plays Robotics, why did you train a neural network to predict the T matrix? You already had regression proof that there did exist a relationship. So why verify that? Uh, that's a good question. So let me just jump back to uh, let me jump back to the Twitch Plays Robotics project for a moment. Okay. So yes, we did linear regression. We did linear regression, but you remember that um, we didn't use the raw T matrix. We had to make some assumptions about what the relationship between T and O was, which is that um, it's the uh, the number of rows in which there is at least one touch sensor firing that predicts O. So we, as the human investigators, came in with our assumptions about what jump means. And with our assumptions, we found that there is this relationship. But we don't want to build our, our assumptions in to the experiment. Imagine that the command here was not jump, but it was walk forward, turn around, and go back to the origin. I don't know what, uh, what patterns we would expect to see in the robot sensor data that would predict O. Oh, I don't have an assumption in that case. With jump, which is a little bit easier, I can imagine what that relationship might be. But we don't want to make that assumption. We want to try and take ourselves as experts out of the experiment. And the easiest way to do that is to learn a neural network that just receives as input the raw sensor data and tries to predict the crowd's response without any assumptions about what the relationship between T and O might be. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. 
So back to the DotBot project. As I mentioned here, uh, we're asking the crowd to create bodies of robots, to create bodies of robots, and we're going to use an evolutionary algorithm to evolve uh, controllers for those bodies. What is our hypothesis here? Our hypothesis is that people understand the relationship between body and movement, so they may be able, we may be able to draw collectively out of the crowd good body plans for a given fitness function, which in our case is uh, movement away from the origin. So you're all becoming experts on robotics and the biomechanics of locomotion. So uh, again, I'm afraid this doesn't run in the browser anymore, but if it did, we could go directly to the browser and you could try and connect the dots and create the body of a robot that you believe would be easy for evolution to find a controller for that would cause the robot to move far from the origin. Make sense? Okay. So how do we test this hypothesis? Uh, how do we test the question, how good are people at making robot bodies? Well, we did that by, first of all, uh, conducting the following experiment. We invited people to the browser, and uh, the first person to arrive, we're gonna call uh, user one up here. User one draws this robot. They then click go in the interface, which starts an, which creates an evolutionary algorithm around just their robot. So in the same way that you've wrapped an evolutionary algorithm around your quadruped, the DotBot project will wrap an evolutionary algorithm around this robot created by this user. By clicking go repeatedly, um, the user will advance an evolutionary algorithm uh, and evolve controller, continue to evolve controllers on user one's local laptop. Um, the black arrow inside the panels here represents how far the robot has moved from the left to the right. And um, somebody else might come to the website, like user 387, and they can uh, also uh, take over this robot or draw this exact robot. And then when they click go, instead of the DotBot project wrapping a separate evolutionary algorithm around uh, the robot on this person's computer. It simply continues the evolutionary algorithm for this robot running on user 387's laptop. Some short time later, user 2 is watching user 1 and 387 evolve controllers for this robot, and user 2 decides that this is not a good body for which to evolve uh, locomotion. So instead, this user draws this body and starts clicking go on her computer. User four sees user two doing this and draws this exact same body plan, takes over this evolutionary algorithm, evolves controllers a little bit further for this robot on their computer. User uh, 1142 is watching users two and four, draws this uh, robot and so on. So different users can uh, can contribute more or less computational effort to robots that they themselves design or robots that they see other people having success with. User one um, while they were working on their robot, uh, pauses and watches the action among users 24 and 1142 and realizes that uh, user 2's body plan is maybe better than their, their body plan. So user 1 discards their body plan and makes a, a, a variation or a modification to user 2's body plan, which is basically just make it bigger. User one, uh, the moment that user one makes this new body, the DotBot project again wraps an evolutionary algorithm around this new body. User one clicks go and starts an evolutionary algorithm evolving controllers on their body plan. User 14 uh, sees this as a promising body plan and contributes more computational effort. Uh, and so does user 92. Uh, and so on. So we have multiple users that are creating or uh, adopting body plans from other users. Um, so the crowd is creating bodies and the DotBot project is evolving controllers for those bodies. 
Uh, again, just remember, ask any questions in chat if you have any. <clears throat> You'll notice that each uh, robot is visualized here, uh, is drawn, when the user draws it or creates it, it's drawn in gray. And once the evolutionary algorithm takes over, it's shown in red and blue. That's visualizing the controller that is running on the robot. You'll see that in panel B and C, it's exactly the same robot, but a different combination of red and blue segments representing there, these are two different controllers running on the same body plan. Let's talk about what those controllers are before continuing on with the description of the experiment. Let me just skip ahead a little bit. Here we go. Okay, so as, as you saw in the interface, people create uh, robots by connecting dots together. Once they do, and we click go in um, the simulator, you'll notice that each dot becomes a small cube. Each dot becomes a small cube, and each uh, line connecting pairs of dots together becomes a rectangular solid that's connecting these cubes together. So if we look at just this part of the robot's body, we have two dots and one connecting segment. We have, wherever that is down here, uh, two cubes with a connecting uh, unit between them. So uh, that means that we have three objects and we have two joints, one connecting the uh, one dot to the line and a second joint connecting the second dot to the line. Okay, how do I get out of this? Okay. Okay, so um, what, do, what do the controllers look like? Well, um, we're going to, the user creates uh, the segments, so we're going to create a very long binary vector. This vector is going to be used for the controller. This binary vector is composed of triplets where the middle uh, digit in each triplet is a zero or one representing whether, uh, uh, whether there is or isn't a connecting line between that pair of dots. So this is a very long binary vector. There is a triplet for every possible connection between neighboring pairs of dots. Um, in this example here, uh, there'd be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. There's 17 possible bars, so the binary vector would be 17 triplets. Only two of those triplets would have a one in the center position, corresponding to the two out of the 17 possible uh, bars. Remember that uh, for each of these bars, it has to be connected at either end to, uh, to the, uh, the connecting cube. So we've got two rotational joints that are going to be placed connecting that, uh, that cube to that rectangular solid and the second neighboring cube to that rectangular solid. We're going to connect them with hinge joints and instead of using a neural network controller, we're going to just send a sinusoidal desired angle to the joint. So if you remember from our discussion from last time, this means uh, open loop control. So there are no sensors on this robot. It is simply sending a sinusoidal pattern to uh, the joint that connects the cube to the rectangular solid. If uh, the zero or one represents the phase offset of that sinusoidal pattern. So in this cartoon example here, you can see that for this particular bar, uh, the two joints at the left and the right side, the left and the right side of this bar, um, they have different phase offset. So if you imagine my two fists connected with the bar, they're going to rotate sinusoidally out of phase. If they were both zero, that means they would be rotating in phase. If a neighboring pair, if, the, if there's one bar that has both zeros, those two are rotating in phase with one another. If another linkage like this one here has two ones, then those two are, the two ones are in phase with one another, but those two ones are out of phase 
with the zeros uh, on the other bar. I can't do that. Uh, I don't have four fifths, but hopefully you get the idea. So if we then go back to our original visualization of this experiment, Red and blue represent uh, pieces that are rotating in uh, antiphase to each other. So the red ones, red ones are parts of the robot that are all rotating in phase with one another, and red and blue parts represent things that are rotating out of phase with each other. So going back to that binary vector, um, all of the joints that are painted with a zero are blue in this picture, and all of the joints that are painted red are, uh, have a, a value of one in that binary matrix. Okay. As I mentioned, when a user creates a robot body, the DotBot project wraps an evolutionary algorithm around it. That evolutionary algorithm is evolving these binary vectors. So this is the genotype. Imagine we have a population of these binary vectors. The middle values in each triplet are grayed out. Evolution can't alter those because those grayed out values represent the body of the robot. But evolution can change the left and right values in the triplets. It can alter the phase offsets of uh, the joints, which represents changes to the open loop controller of the robot. So far, so good. So a lot of moving pieces, no pun intended, in this experiment. So we have multiple people. Um, we have multiple bodies. In this example, a cartoon here, we have three different bodies. For each of those bodies, we have an evolutionary algorithm that's evolving, uh, that assigns a population of controllers to each of those bodies and is evolving those controllers to try and get the robot to move as far from the origin as possible. And people are sharing computational effort. If, if two different people draw exactly the same robot body, then the evolutionary algorithm associated with that body is running on both machines. There's twice as much computational effort being supplied to that evolutionary algorithm compared to another robot body. As you can imagine, what, the, what we're trying to test here is how good are people at making bodies that require less computational effort on, um, in the evolutionary algorithm. The evolutionary algorithm has to run fewer, neuro, uh, fewer controllers or evolve fewer controllers to get far distance from the origin. In this cartoon example here, this body is not so good takes a lot of generations of the evolutionary algorithm associated with this body to get it to travel far from the origin. This body, in the cartoon at least, we're assuming is a good body, and it takes relatively few generations of the evolutionary algorithm associated with this body to get it to, to move far from the origin. The hypothesis that we're going to try and test and that we'll look at in more detail Thursday morning is does the crowd do this? Does the crowd generally converge on drawing or creating bodies that enable efficient controller evolution? Or does the crowd sort of wander through the space of all possible bodies and never find, collectively as a crowd, good bodies? And what, how do we actually measure convergence to good bodies? What exactly does that uh, mean? Okay, I think we have reached a good point to pause for today. Uh, we'll continue on with this on Thursday. Uh, just as a reminder to the University of Vermont students, um, you are now working on your final project. Um, graduate students, you're continuing to work on your final project. There will be a quiz due tonight, and I will see you all back here on the stream uh, Thursday morning. Okay, have a good, uh, good day. Bye-bye.